Miguel, do you think we should get started? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so hello to everyone. I see that some people are still joining in. So welcome to our second webinar. This is part of the of the webinars uh, that we are uh, planning to conduct as part of the uh, implementation study that the IADA project, which is uh, detecting and, and integrating depression and alcohol use uh, care in primary care in Colombia. This is a NIMH funded uh, implementation research program that's being conducted by uh, researchers from Dartmouth uh, College and from Pontificia Universidad Javeriana in, in Bogota. So we're very happy to have you with, uh, with our new uh, presentation, which <coughs> is on integrating depression and alcohol use disorder care in primary care, which is going to be delivered by Dr. William Torrey. Uh, Dr. Torrey is professor and vice chair of clinical service for the Department of Psychiatry <coughs> School of Medicine at Dartmouth, and he has devoted much of his professional life to improving the care of adults with severe mental illness and integrating psychiatric care into primary care. As you see from the bio that was distributed earlier, he has extensive experience both in teaching, researching, writing, and the integration of uh, mental health in primary care. So we are happy to welcome Dr. Torrey, and I'm going to do a brief uh, introduction in Spanish. So, bienvenidos todos al segundo webinar, que es parte del proyecto de implementación del proyecto DIADA, que es sobre la detección y atención de depresión y problemas de uso de alcohol en atención primaria, cuyo principal eh, eh, foco es eh, mejorar eh, los procesos de atención en tres sitios en Colombia. Y esto es un proyecto que es financiado por el Instituto Nacional de Salud Mental de los Estados Unidos y es conducido sobre todo por investigadores del eh, College de eh, Dartmouth y también de Pontificia Universidad Javeriana. Esta conferencia va a ser dictada por el doctor Torrey, quien es profesor y vicedecano de servicios clínicos del Departamento de Psiquiatría de la Escuela Jaisel de Medicina de Dartmouth y tiene una extensa experiencia en integración de atención de salud mental a nivel de atención primaria, tanto en educación, en investigación, en, en, en docencia y eh, damos la bienvenida al doctor Torrey. Vamos a dedicar un tiempo y al final va a haber un eh, tiempo para preguntas eh, de, la, de la audiencia. Entonces, eh, so, doctor Torrey, please uh, welcome. Thank you very much. So, um, I'm going to speak today about the integration of depression and alcohol use disorder care in primary care. Um, I started to get interested in this for the same reason that we're interested in it. Um, the fundamentally, um, both here in the United States and across the world, um, there is much more um, suffering from depression and alcohol use disorder uh, than is uh, resources available to uh, address it. So um, I'm going to start today by just laying out the problem briefly and then talking about what we do know, uh, or then talking about why focus on primary care, and then a little bit on what do we know about treatment of depression and alcohol use disorder in primary care settings, and then uh, finish up by talking about the literature on implementation. What does it take to actually get practices into place that are effective, um, and trying to think with you about what's the nature of the practice that would be likely to be effective in these settings. So to start with, um, the, the alcohol and depression, alcohol use disorders and depression are just incredibly common, very painful, sometimes deadly, often disabling, expensive for the healthcare system and for society, and they respond to treatment when it's available, uh, but it's very hard to get access to treatment. So I'm going to go into each of these a little bit. So first of all, um, studies in Latin America have shown that the annual prevalence for major depression is about 5% and for alcohol use disorders, uh, almost 6%. Um, and that in studies in Colombia have shown that annual prevalence rates of 
about 18% for any mental disorder. Studies in the United States show annual prevalence rates of about 30%, so this number for Columbia may be low. Um, and, and over a lifetime, studies in the United States have shown that about you know, 45% of us are likely to have some kind of mental health or substance use disorder in a lifetime. So, so just to start with, these are incredibly common difficulties. Um, uh, I actually was at a Grand Rounds this morning by a speaker um, uh, who was talking about post-traumatic stress disorder and noted that in the United States, the risk is about 8% in a lifetime, and that in countries that have experienced more trauma, the rates are quite a bit higher, and post-traumatic stress disorder is associated with depression and alcohol use difficulties. So uh, Columbia has been through a lot, and so have many other countries across the globe, and um, it's likely that the rates of PTSD are extremely high. Um, this is not the core focus of this intervention, but since depression and alcohol use disorders go along with it, it's, it's going to be part of the what is seen in action. So be before getting into the next slide, I just also want to say something about how painful these difficulties are. Um, no one asks to have a major depression, and no one asks to have an alcohol use disorder. Having an alcohol use disorder feels terrible. People feel out of control. They feel that they're not in charge of their lives. They can feel absolutely miserable. Um, I, and depression is, has really no clear redeeming features. I, I was uh, last week uh, speaking to a physician who I take care of um, who was telling me that when he is just recovering from a depression, and he said when he was depressed, it was really baffling to him because he takes care of people with depression all the time. And when he's taking care of them, he can talk to them about it being a disease and about it being something they're not choosing to uh, feel terrible. But when it was him, he said he just couldn't do that. He just blamed himself, and he felt guilty, and he felt it was his fault. Um, and I said to him, yeah, you both felt terrible, and you felt terrible about feeling terrible. And his response to me was, well, it was even worse than that. I felt terrible about feeling terrible about feeling terrible. Um, so I just think that was an example of just how awful it feels and how hard it is to separate yourself from the low feelings when you have a serious depression. Um, uh, we're, you know, any of us who are alive for any period of time know many, many people who uh, live with alcohol use disorders, uh, if we don't ourselves, or uh, depression if we haven't experienced ourselves in, in our community here, which is a beautiful place um, with a lot um, going on that's positive. Last week, a friend took his own life by shooting himself in his home, um, and this is something that uh, happens very frequently. In, in fact, in the United States, suicide is the ninth most common cause of death. Um, uh, um, and this slide shows the age how uh, that for people between the ages of 15 and 34, it's the second most co common cause of death in the United States. Um, and in Colombia, in, in Latin America, where the average age, I believe, is quite a bit younger, that it, suicide may be even higher uh, in terms of uh, its uh, relative position to other causes of death. But it's a very, I think people are not generally aware of how common it is for people to die by suicide. That's partly because um, um, people often don't write it in their obituary. They don't refer to it. It's in the United, here in the United States, it's starting to be more common that people talk about how people died when they died of suicide, but until recently, it really, people don't talk about it. So I think people tend to not be aware of how common it is. So these are painful illnesses that can lead to death. Um, in fact, both alcohol and depression are very high major risk factors for suicide. Suicide's the leading cause of violent death worldwide. And, and reading in preparation for this talk, I was interested to see that in studies where they compare uh, men and women um, alcohol use, if, if women drink an average of two drinks or more or men drink an average of four drinks or more um, on the average daily, that they die uh, younger than people that are non-drinkers. So even 
what looks like fairly moderate use is, can lead to excess mortality. And studies that have looked at mental health issues and how they affect death worldwide have shown that about 14% of deaths are attributable to mental disorders. So you have these common painful illnesses that are sometimes deadly. Uh, in addition to that, there can be extremely disabling. Um, a lot, there's increasing evidence that depression is a major cause of disability worldwide, disease burden. Um, the, for employers, um, back pain and depression are shown to be the most expensive conditions if you include the missed work, cost of treatment, and the both the absenteeism and the going to work but not really being able to do your job because of the dis disabling uh, effects of depression. Um, and then if you look at people who have chronic general medical concerns, most of the disability that's associated with those concerns is in the people that also have depression. So if you have diabetes or heart disease or other conditions, if you also have depression, that is a major uh, uh, factor in, in disability related to the illness. And in addition, they're very expensive. So they, they add tremendous cost to general health care, and they are, studies have shown that they cost a huge amount uh, worldwide. Um, so having said all that, in addition, um, that would be, you know, that would be terrible, but we probably wouldn't be talking if it weren't for the fact that if you actually get people treatment that's been shown to work, they get better. We have, we know a lot about what helps people, psychotherapy, medications, and increasing evidence that web-based therapeutic interventions can make a difference. Actually, at this uh, talk this morning on PTSD, they reported on a study that, uh, where they, for people who, combat veterans who had PTSD and alcohol use disorders, a web-based intervention that they put together was as effective as face-to-face -face treatment, and they, people did rather well with it. So there's a number of, we're, uh, we know that there are interventions that can really make a difference if we can identify who's living with the difficulty and get them the treatment in an appropriate way. Uh, but we know currently that uh, in uh, it's current that most people don't have access uh, to care. Um, the study in Columbia recently showed that only about 11 percent of people receive care who have a mental health disorder, um, um, and relatively small amounts of health budgets go to this. All right, so that's the nature of the difficulty that we're trying to address. But why are we talking about integrating it in the care into primary care? Well, the main reason is that uh, primary care is where the patients are. Um, that's where people go for help, um, and that's true in the United States, and uh, where there is a significant amount of specialty mental health care available, but in parts of the world where there is much less specialty mental health care, the proportion of people seeking help in primary care is going to be even higher. So in the United States, most people don't get any care at all. So 60% of people who have a psychiatric uh, mental health or addiction problem don't get any care. But of those that do get care, most of the people get it uh, in primary care settings. Um, and people don't often come in saying, I'm depressed or I'm struggling with my alcohol use. They, they come in uh, with physical complaints. Um, and if you go through a review of systems, asking them how's your, you know, how's your breathing, do you have any aches and pains, how's your urinary function, but then you get a lot more complaints from people that are depressed or have other psychiatric difficulties. And uh, as many as 50% of people presenting in primary care will have a behavioral health uh, difficulty. And when people come in, they complain they, that the peop, they often have a lot of symptoms. They talk about not being able to function very well. They describe worries. They describe troubles in their relationships. Um, lots of sort of general malaise. Um, and then in addition, there have been a number of studies that have really shown that people uh, will present uh, to primary care 
uh, shortly before dying by suicide. Um, often they're, that's not what they're complaining about, and, um, but a screening for depression and alcohol use disorders, which are very treatable, has the potential to uh, decrease um, suicide, although that hasn't been shown in studies to date. All right, so this is a group of um, birch trees outside my window at home, and this is after an ice storm, and you can see that the trees are really burdened um, by the ice. Um, when people have looked at care of mental health, addict, depression, and alcohol use disorders in primary care, uh, they found that uh, they often go unaddressed. They aren't screened for and they aren't addressed. And part of the reason that the primary care system gives for this uh, is that they already are doing so much. They just can't imagine doing more. They feel like these trees. Um, so the interventions that people have tried to do to uh, both screen for and then address uh, depression and, and psychiatric and alcohol use disorders in primary care have really aimed to package the intervention so that they unburden the primary care uh, teams and help them to do their job more effectively and feel supported. So the core elements of the, so next I'm gonna talk about the practices that have really been shown to work in helping primary care systems to identify and address depression and alcohol use disorders. So uh, there's a book that just came out this month, actually, by Lori Rainey uh, talk, that is on implementing integrated care. Um, and she's a psychiatrist who's done a lot of work in this area for the last 10 or 15 years. And she indicated in her book that there are some core elements of what is where the research supports integrated care. And, they, and she says that the areas that really matter um, are to take a population focused approach. So what you're trying to do is think about um, uh, how, to, for the population that presents in this clinic, how can I identify and decrease the burden of illness in depression and alcohol use disorder for this whole population? What, how to change the structure of care to improve uh, outcomes? That what works seems to be a team-based approach where you're kind of working collaboratively with the whole team to address this. Uh, that you uh, put into place uh, evidence-based practices, um, and importantly, that the pra your practice is guided by measurement over time, and that you're accountable, so that there's some systems feedback about how you're doing. The main kind of practice that has been shown to be effective for, first for depression, but then for more kinds of psychiatric difficulties um, is called collaborative care. And in a collaborative care um, um, implementation, you add a few elements. Uh, the PCP means the primary care doctor, and historically they would work directly with the patient with no one else involved um, and try to address things. The collaborative care adds another person who helps uh, monitor how the patient's doing and communicates to the, both to the patient and to the PCP about how they're doing. And for patients that aren't doing well, are doing well as expected, consulting with a psychiatrist. So this is the core model that um, has been demonstrated to work in many studies. So the, there have now been over 100 studies that look at some variation of this kind of implementation, uh, this kind of model. And the, they really have shown a, significant um, improvement over a usual care. And the studies show improved depression and anxiety symptoms, that people who get this kind of organized, systematic approach uh, do re get better faster, and they tend to get better all the way compared to usual care. People tend to stay with their plan. They, their social and physical function can improve. They're more satisfied with the care. The providers are more satisfied uh, with their own work because um, it's dissatisfying to not be able to help people. And that they, it appears to work for all ages and across many psychiatric conditions and can save healthcare costs. This is Intermountain Health in, um, is a large healthcare organization 
that studied costs quite carefully. And I showed this slide because it, they, they were able to demonstrate uh, cost savings in the healthcare system by implementing a, a, a systematic approach to mental health care. And, but what's interesting to me is that they didn't save money in providing mental health care. The place they saved money was in general medical inpatient admissions and general medical emergency room visits. So, um, sorry, someone needs to mute their line, I think. Um, but so they were able to find um, improvement uh, savings in general health care um, from addressing mental health care. Um, the people that are, have researched um, collaborative care are starting to really uh, hone in on what they think are the active ingredients of, of the care, what really matters in making a difference. Um, that what, and what they are starting to highlight is screening and then having a systematic approach to diagnosis, so moving from screening to making the diagnosis, initiating treatment really quickly within the first four weeks, um, um, using measurement-based care, measuring um, for depression PHQ-9 or for alcohol use disorder uh, audit C or some measure over time to see how the person's doing, and then using that measurement to step up care for people that aren't uh, getting better as expected, and then using consultants sparingly, but for the people that really aren't getting better in the way that you expect. So here's some of the evidence for that. This was a study, a large study in Washington State where they compared a collaborative care approach to usual care. And what they showed was that the collaborative care approach got people better from depression much more quickly. The top line is the collaborative care uh, remission, percentage of remissions, and the bottom line is the usual care. And both improved, people got better from depression in both uh, settings, but they did so much more quickly when they had a collaborative care approach. This what came from a recent study where they compared um, two, uh, um, all, all collaborative care studies in both arms, but they saw who, got, who had follow-up within the first four weeks. So the, it turned out that people that got rapid follow-up, they identified depression, made the diagnosis, and then quickly went after the depression, that those people uh, got better much more quickly and they, and really over time, more of them got better. So addressing the depression quickly seems to make a big difference both in how quickly people get better, but also how many of them get better. Then when you talk to the people that have really been the core people studying the collaborative care, integrated care for the last 20, 25 years, they really point to their thought that measuring is what matters the most. So measuring uh, depression, so they, for depression, they tend to use the PHQ-9, which is a nine item depression scale, and then track it over time. What they say is if you don't track it over time, you don't take the actions that you need to take um, when someone is uh, not doing as well as you'd expect or when their symptoms get worse. They say that in routine, uh, outcomes in just in the community, people don't do as well as in studies, and that's partly because in studies there's always uh, feedback of symptoms in a regular basis. They also note that when they, clinical judgment alone is used to see whether someone's doing worse, that only about 21.4% of mental health providers notice that the symptoms are worse compared to what, what, when you measure. Um, and they speculate that this is partly because you know, patients want us to, they, they want to come back and be a good patient and say they're doing better. They, they in, in just talking to us directly, they're likely to downplay their suffering. Um, but if you measure it, you, uh, you catch it uh, much more regularly, which then gives you the opportunity to overcome the inertia in treatment. When you're seeing patients all day long, it's always easier to do nothing than to do something. So 
the, what measurement does is give you a signal that there's a reason you need to do something and focuses the attention. I, in my practice, I think measurement is extremely helpful for another reason, which is that measurement helps to externalize the symptoms so that you and the patient can then sit side by side and look at the symptoms together, especially if you can put the measurement on a screen and look at it together on a graph. Um, you can then work collaboratively on addressing it. And I think that, that that is helpful psychologically to feel like you're in partnership with the person you're trying to help um, and the person feels like they're in partnership with you and together you're going to address this and take it seriously. Um, they also, in the recent article uh, on measurement-based care, really talk about why, um, what doesn't work. And it doesn't seem to help if you just screen uh, one time. That doesn't make outcomes come up better. It doesn't help if you check out the PHQ-9 just every six months or if you monitor outside the clinical context. So you, if you give feedback back to clinicians, but it's, uh, but it's not at the time of the clinical interaction. What really seems to matter is that you measure and you do it at close to the time when the doctor's seeing the patient so that the measurement becomes part of the visit so that it's clinically actionable. Um, they had a great quote in a talk that I heard on this at the recent American Psychiatric Association meeting. They said that it, the measurement isn't the issue, it's the act, having the measurement that's available to act on it. And they, the quote was, you can't fatten a cow just by weighing it. It's so, um, And they compare measurement-based care, and this is patient-delivered uh, uh, um, information. They compare it in psychiatry to the um, hemoglobin A1C or the glucose in depression or the blood pressure measurements for high blood pressure. That that measurement then can spur action and treatment. So now I'm shifting a little bit to the literature on alcohol uh, use disorders. One of the interventions that's been studied the most for alcohol use disorders in primary care is called ESPERT, which stands for Screening, Brief Treatment, and Referral, or brief and referral to Treatment. Um, and what the, this intervention has been shown to decrease the frequency and severity of alcohol use, uh, decrease people's visits to the emergency room or days in the hospital, and to decrease health care costs. Um, the, the, the people who talk about this say that the, if you think about all of, you know, all of us have a relationship to substances, and most of us either don't use substances or, or use them in a manner that's a low risk use um, for, um, but then there's about 20, 25 percent of people that use alcohol in a manner that's risky, who use uh, um, uh, three or more drinks a day for women or four or five drinks or more a day for men, uh, which puts people at uh, higher risk uh, for uh, complications of general medical conditions, higher risk for accidents, um, and then there's people at the top of the pyramid, probably about 5% or so, who have an alcohol use disorder. The ESPERT intervention appears to be absolutely most effective in the risky use area. So these are people who are using alcohol in a way that is unhealthy um, for them, um, but it hasn't become a full-fledged addictive process. Um, the, um, and th those are the people that get the most benefit out of an ESPERT kind of intervention. And ESPERT is an intervention that can be taught and trained uh, so that people in primary care settings can, can offer it. The, in looking at what are the active ingredients within ESPERT that really make a difference, um, the, uh, all the, the review of a bunch of different studies for this have shown that the, the the common active ingredients appear to be uh, screening, uh, then giving people advice and feedback on their alcohol use, comparing their alcohol use to others, com 
uh, helping people to see uh, the literature on the risks of alcohol use at the level that they're using, um, and then uh, trying to engage in some motivational interviewing. And as people may know, motivational interviewing is a style of interacting that uh, makes an effort to um, uh, work with the person about their own life goals and to think about how behavior change um, might help them meet their life goals and to um, not get into a, a lecturing or arguing kind of relationship, but rather work with the individual uh, to uh, weigh the pros and cons of making a change and help the individual to make the choice, him or herself, to make a change. Um, goal setting is part of what appears to be important. And then follow up, so make, following up, you know, make, communicating to the individual you are important, your life is important, uh, this is an important issue, let's keep working on it together um, in meeting. So overall, putting in an intervention into primary care, um, uh, we, the, you want the nature of the intervention to be something that's likely to work um, the, uh, and likely to be helpful. So an evidence, you know, as close to the evidence as possible. Um, I remember when we first started to talk about putting behavioral health interventions, depression and alcohol use disorder care into our primary care settings here at Dartmouth, um, we happened to have a number of people that had been active in the research in collaborative care across the country. Um, and we asked their advice about what to do. And I remember pretty clearly this national expert who was on our faculty here saying, well, you know, I think the most important thing is to do something um, and, to, uh, and to work with the clinic to see what's possible and then to start to intervene um, and put something in place that has a chance of improving the care. Um, the, the ideal, and it helps to, you need to bring the practice some help. Um, so the kinds of tools that tend to be helpful in getting to an effective uh, practice in primary care include you need in, is is building out a systematic way uh, to do the care so that um, the, the you change the flow of care so that it has a better chance of having the outcomes you're looking for. So you want to put into place some kind of screening process to help people identify the help the patients and the doctors to identify whether someone looks like they might have a trouble a problem with alcohol use disorder or uh, depression. You want to help the providers to have easy access to guidelines for evidence-based care so that they can access help quickly and easily on the fly while they're taking care of patients. Uh, you want to have already organized educational material for the patients because uh, they're the number one partner in this. If uh, These are persistent kinds of difficulties and we know that for any kind of difficult persistent difficulty, the person who has the biggest impact on healthcare outcome is the patient, him or herself. So we're trying to help them to have the skills, knowledge, and confidence to help manage the problem. So educational materials are part of that. Um, you want to put into place some kind of process, measure, uh, a process to measure outcome over time, as we talked about. And many practices put in a registry so that they can look at the population as a whole and see who's getting better and who's not getting better registries are kind of tools to help manage the health of the population. Um, and then you want to have some way to get consultation support for people that aren't improving as, as you would expect in the time frame you'd expect. So this is a picture of my brother uh, who uh, is a kind of likes to go in parades, and this is my brother as a one-man band. So you can see he has a big drum on his back and snare drums in front and cymbals on his head and on his shoulder. And I put this in because um, sometimes when you go to uh, try to put some new function into primary care, um, you have to realize that they're doing a lot already. So uh, putting in depression and alcohol use disorder screening and intervention into primary care is a little bit like putting a couple more instruments onto my brother uh, for his one-man band. Um, so you have to really work with the site and, and 
and work carefully to design it so that it helps and doesn't make uh, things harder, but in fact improves the flow of care and improves the sense of competence and effectiveness of the service. So people have studied what really makes a difference when you're trying to implement uh, uh, integrated care. So the things that have consistently been shown to make a difference is having a leader in the practice who's practical, who understands how the flow of work works, who can help uh, make changes as you go along. There's uh, implementation. Uh, there's never been that I've ever heard of an implementation that hasn't run into problems. The difference between implementations that go well and ones that don't go well tends to be having someone um, who is present who can solve the problems, who's empowered to and who's activated and who's trying to make things better. Uh, then part of that is getting into place the staff and creating a team structure that supports the aims of the implementation. And typically, the physicians are the hardest people to change. Um, the physicians tend to have a lot of training and they tend to get into uh, pat set pathways of how they do the work and they take extra work to uh, make any kind of uh, practice change. They also tend to be very busy and it's hard to get their attention and focus. Uh, so it's clear that thinking about the physicians uh, at the start is important in implementing a practice change. Um, you can't do it alone with physicians because you need to change the flow of work and it, that uh, involves reception and uh, nursing and uh, all the different elements of the team, but the physicians need some extra attention. Um, and then what helps these practices stay once they've been implemented? It, the studies of this have shown that uh, it's incredibly helpful if you have good, strong outcomes that you can feed back to the practice and show the change. Again, it helps to have people that have found that this is important and who champion it over time, uh, both on the ground leaders and more senior leaders who support the, what the clinic is trying to do to address depression and alcohol use disorders. Getting help from the information technology really matters, so you need the people that uh, can help you there. And then, of course, any kind of external pressure that keeps you going tends to help. So pressure from contracts or regulators or performance measures, competition from one practice to another, anything that helps people stay focused on this population and take it seriously and keep trying to improve their practice based on measurement. Very similarly, the sustaining facilitators for ESPERT have been shown to have people that are champ who champion it in the practice, having some way to pay for it, changing the flow of work so that doing ESPERT is the new normal. It becomes how practice takes place. And then again, a leader who can deal with the challenges as they come up. Um, so I'm coming to the end and trying to come back to the individual. So the reason for um, trying to improve uh, depression and alcohol use disorder care is really about the people, that these are very painful conditions, they're very treatable, but what we really want as people who are trying to provide health care is to have the system set up and be prepared so that when people come in with these common difficulties, they automatically are screened, they're automa the, the systems for taking care of them are in place, the providers don't have to make it up from scratch each time, um, that, that they meet with the care that meets their need. Again, there's no health without mental health, so primary care settings really can't be effective even for caring for general medical concerns if they're not also caring for the mental health concerns that either come separately or with the general medical concerns. So this is a photo of my daughter when she was younger. I think it's just a nice photo and it just reminds me to that if she develops a depression or de develops a problem with alcohol as she gets older, that I want her to be able to walk into a healthcare setting anywhere and where it gets identified and where it gets addressed in a, a respectful and effective manner. So that's really 
what I have to say. And not, I just put this photo up of mountain range in New Hampshire, not as impressive as the mountain range in uh, Columbia, but um, this was, uh, we got above the clouds and I just put this up as a backdrop for discussion to uh, talk about any of this that's of interest to you. So thank you Will, very much for your presentation. So right now we have some minutes for people to to jump in with any questions, uh, any comments, and also if uh, anyone wants to do the question in, in Spanish, we can try to translate it to English if needed. So uh, the mic is open for questions. I would like to ask one question. First, thank you, Will. It was a great presentation. It was nicely packed up all that's been going on in integrating primary care, integrating more with mental health issues, <laughs> primary care. But I would like to know about the measurement. This is an important thing, so you can get better in treating depression and alcohol use. But right now, most studies use symptom-based scales for the follow-up and measure the outcomes of the treatment. What do you think about the trend of changing these symptom-based scales into functioning-based scales in primary care? Uh, um, so, uh, obviously, or maybe not obviously, but um, the purpose of addressing symptoms um, is not for the intellectual benefit of improving symptoms, and nor and and symptoms are clearly important but they are important in large part for helping people to have the life that they want, to both suffer less and then function better. Um, I think that there, that it is, um, I think that measuring function over time um, is also extremely important. Most of the studies have really focused on symptoms for depression and the not, um, not studied function immediately in the clinical enterprise. Um, so I guess I would follow what people know already, although the, the other problem with um, screening and measurement over time is trying to avoid uh, too much measurement. Um, Patients can easily feel overwhelmed by having too much screening and too much measurement. Um, and so you have to be careful not to look at too many things at the same time and be very parsimonious in the, in the measurement. Um, I guess the other part clinically that we find, in because we measure symptoms with every visit, is that you have to um, give people a lot of feedback about uh, you have to thank them for having done the scale. You have to talk to them about the findings. You have to basically reinforce people uh, providing the um, information about how they're doing. So I guess that's uh, a roundabout answer, but I, I do think it would be great to measure function over time if there was a, a, a well-developed functional scale that uh, could complement a symptom scale and wasn't, didn't add too much burden. But in the, in the practice of how people are doing it now, um, people tend to not measure function directly as the main target. I guess I have one more thing to say, which is that a lot of the healthcare interventions that the physicians will do in primary care um, are symptom-based, so they're you know, aiming to improve symptoms and hoping that the function would follow. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Yeah.
Any other questions? Hi, we will. I do have another question. In, in many places, for example, in, in, in our experience in Colombia, Latin America, it seems that uh, integrating depression might be not as difficult as the integration of alcohol use problems because many physicians and many uh, health professionals do still think, in a sense, that it's very difficult to to implement effective intervention for, for alcohol use disorders. And uh, also because uh, even if, if, if mental health has, has not been integrated to primary care, even more so the case for substance abuse and other kind of problems because they tend to be managed even in a different settings. They are not managed in, even in, in primary care settings in many places in, in, in Colombia. So uh, what would you say about this? extra barriers for the specific problem of alcohol use disorders? I, I think there are extra barriers for addressing alcohol use disorders in primary care everywhere. And I think it's partly, um, the, I think what makes it possible to start to do it um, is that there's an increasing um, understanding of alcohol use disorders and other addictions as diseases. Um, I think part one of the major barriers to addressing um, alcohol use disorders in particular has been that people have seen uh, unhealthy alcohol use as a moral issue um, and they've seen addic addiction difficulties as willful misbehavior. Um, and increasingly, it's clear that um, that the difficulty with alcohol or other substances has all the same qualities as any other disease, um, and that people aren't choosing to have difficulty uh, with this, these substances. And I think it's keeping thinking about alcohol use um, as a disease that is the place that uh, alcohol use disorders as a disease that's a starting point. The other challenge, uh, because that makes it fodder, you know, it makes it a health concern it, um, and allows people to think of it as a health concern. Um, I think one of the other challenges um, is that the providers themselves have their own relationship with alcohol, so they have to uh, be comfortable enough with their own relationship with alcohol to then um, be able to uh, step away from that and and think about the care of the patient in front of them. Um, and so, you know, since almost everyone uses alcohol, you know, everyone has to work out their own relationship with alcohol, so that makes it a little more complicated. Um, I think a third difficulty with addressing alcohol is that the measurement of symptoms, uh, you know, what you measure over time is not as um, well developed. I think we need a better measurement for alcohol difficulties and, and other substance difficulties over time that is more like the PHQ-9, um, and no one has really come up with that yet. Uh, uh, and so it's hard to have this objective measure. The closest thing is used or not used, so something like the Audit C um, gives you some information that you can track over time. But in fact, you know, there, people can get better from, um, you know, can do, there's a harm reduction element to alcohol use difficulty, so you can reduce your use and, and reduce the harm without stopping altogether uh, for, for many people, although stopping altogether is probably the most effective treatment for people that really end up with an alcohol use disorder. The other thing that I think would help the primary care um, to address alcohol is if the, is use of medicine as part of the treatment um, or having some, or I guess I would say the thing that helps any, uh, in primary care, anyone to then intervene uh, more screen for and intervene more is if they feel like they have something to do when they 
find that they have a difficulty. So if you can train people to do the brief intervention and they get good at it, they have something to do when they find someone has risky alcohol use. And if you can train people and they have available naltrexone or other medicines that clearly have been shown to uh, reduce heavy alcohol use um, and they have an action they can take, they're more likely to then look for alcohol use difficulties and use the medicine. If they have a web-based intervention that they can recommend, that they understand and they feel confident in, that they believe could help people, uh, then they are much more likely to pay attention and, and focus in on screening for and diagnosing and treating alcohol use disorder. So I do think that in primary care people have been reluctant to address alcohol use disorder, partly because they feel like what's the point of identifying something if I don't have anything I can do for the person. Um, but I, now I believe we have more tools that are available for them so that they can then do more and then that will increase, that tends to increase people's confidence and interest in, um, in caring for people that have these difficulties. Does that make sense to you? Yes, we are, thanks. Yeah. Oh, we'll... Yeah. Thank you very much for, for the presentation. Uh, we enjoyed uh, a lot of the presentation. I would like to ask about a stigma and how do you manage the stigma in the health prof the professionals and also in in the the patients because uh, 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 the barrier that that we have been seeing other barrier is the stigma that the professional have around the alcohol and depression. How do you manage that type of thing? I think that, um, well, I'll tell you what I tr try to do um, is to humanize the whole issue. As I, um, I probably tried to model a little bit in this talk. So, I, you know, I'm almost 60 years old and I've lived long enough so that I just, you just can't live for very long in this world without seeing people that have serious problems with depression and alcohol use, your friends, yourself, your family members, you know, you're going to see people. And so I think part of what helps is to, is to start to be more real about these difficulties. These are things that we all face. There's no health without mental health. It's not something that happens to other people. It's something that happens to all of us in our lives. And so, uh, you know, trying to talk to people about that, trying to get, you know, if I give a talk with an audience, I usually ask people if they themselves or someone they love has lived with one of these difficulties. Almost everyone's hand goes up. So then later in the talk, if, they, if people start to say, well, those people, I say, well, wait a minute, it isn't those people, it's us. This is something, this is human, this is common, this is real suffering, and let's face it directly and try to do something about it. So I think, if, I think a lot of times if you, um, you know, can get, to have a direct real conversation with healthcare providers, you can get them to calm down and to think about it clearly and understand the disease nature. You know, obviously, if you look at all this research on the health impact of alcohol and, and depression, it's enormous. If ignoring it is ignoring a huge, you know, one of the more most impactful kinds of conditions that we can do something about. So the, just those kind of interventions, I think, uh, are how I try to approach it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Well, well, thanks. It looks like we're coming near the end of our time. Um, the, I guess I, I would just like to finish with, uh, you know, we here at Dartmouth have had the experience of implementing uh, depression and alcohol use disorder care in a number of clinics, and I, the the. You, I would say two things. One is that they really don't implement themselves, that paying attention to 
uh, what it is you want to do, and then working with the teams very carefully to change the flow of how care happens and engage them and help, you know, it takes effort to do the implementation. And then the second thing I'd like to say is it's incredibly satisfying work. When, when you get the clinics to screen and treat and, and feel confident about it, the primary care doctors are very grateful that this, you, you bring a huge gift to them by helping them to do this kind of care. Because the patients are there, whether they're screening and treating them effectively or not, and it's not that the patients just appear when you start to do it, they're already there. <coughs> so that it really helps primary care physicians and teams to feel effective at what they're doing. So it's very satisfying, valuable work, and it is work. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.